Our third keynote speaker is Monica Hofter. She is professor of phytopathology and head of the Department of Plants and Crops at the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering of Ghent University in Belgium. She is a general plant pathologist with a wide interest in both fundamental and practical aspects of plant pathogen interactions. Her research interests are biological and integrated control of plant pathogens and natural and induced re resistance mechanisms against fungi and, and bacteria in a wide variety of tropical and temperate crops. She will present her paper entitled, From Chemical Crop Protection to Bio-Inspired Plant Health Management. Please give her a very warm round of applause. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here in Dijon and to see some old friends. And uh, what I would like to do today is to look at uh, the problem uh, from a plant pathologist's point of view and to focus on the fungicides. And first, I want to talk a bit about chemical crop protection. And if you look at the pesticides that are used in the European agriculture, you will see that uh, most pesticides the, that are sold are either uh, fungicides or herbicides. And I will focus today on, on the fungicides, and you can also see uh, the position of France in this situation. And actually, uh, when you look at the climate in Western Europe, it's a climate with uh, usually uh, humid summers, so it's a climate that is in general conducive for fungal uh, diseases. Now, uh, we are all are aware about the problems that come with uh, pesticides, I'm not going to read to them, but we sometimes seem to forget that pesticides also bring benefits. And uh, one of the benefits that they bring is that they uh, increase the yields, and in some crops they give a large uh, return on uh, investment, besides the other benefits that I have listed here. And I want to focus uh, uh, in, a, in a case study on one of the big problems that we have with the use of chemical pesticides, that is the resistance development. And on the other hand, on one of the benefits that we have with, with pesticides, and that is the large return on investment in some crops. Because I think if you want to reduce the use of pesticides, you need to understand why farmers use them. And uh, you all are aware about the resistance development. I'm not going into detail. It started with the use of systemic uh, fun, uh, pesticides that had a single target. And, and it, it started with the insecticides, but then uh, the wheat, uh, the pesticides, uh, the, the herbicides, and the fungicides soon uh, followed. And the case study that I want to bring to you is the case of wheat. Uh, we heard, uh, hear a lot of wheat uh, today uh, because of the war. Uh, but what you can see in this map of the world are the wheat yields. And uh, if you want to interpret this map, the, more, the darker the color, the more yields. And you see that in different parts of the world, uh, there are a lot of differences in wheat yields. And I looked a bit up some figures and uh, some interesting figures about wheat yields. And you see in the red line is the wheat yield in Africa. The blue line is the wheat yield in the United States in a period that started from the 60s, 2020. And then you see the wheat yield in Western Europe, and the French wheat yield follows more or less uh, the pattern of the, the wheat yield in Western Europe. I also put some figures for those of you who are interested. So in France, we have about 5 million hectares of wheat. Uh, so it's an enormous area that is covered. And you can ask the question, why this difference in yields uh, between the United States and Europe? And uh, one of the answers to that is the use of fungicides. And uh, you have to realize that a lot of the fungicides that we are used uh, are to control one major leaf pathogen, and that leaf pathogen is called Zimoseptoria tritici. It used to have a lot of different names. It, has to, it was before called uh, Mycospherella raminicola and Septoria tritici. Nowadays, we call it Zimoseptoria, and it's a leaf disease. It causes a leaf blight, and in, when the conditions are conducive for this disease, you can have up to 50% of yield losses. And 70% of all the fungicides that are sprayed in Europe on cereals are sprayed to control this uh, disease. And actually, farmers get a huge return on investment by spraying against this disease, uh, because in general, when you control this disease, you can have a yield boost, sorry, uh, a yield boost that can go up to 2.5 tons per hectare. 
And if you just do some calculations, it can give an added value with wheat prices, not of today, but of a few years ago, about 2.4 billion euros. Uh, you can also see that in this graph, if you look at this wheat yield and fungicide use in the UK, uh, you can see very clearly the blue line is the wheat yield. Right? You see that it started to get up the moment that the farmers started to use these uh, single target uh, pesticides. Uh, you see again this huge uh, increase in yields. Uh, and what you can see on the top are the different classes of single target pesticides. But with the use of these pesticides, directly also came the problem of resistance. Uh, so that this pathogen particularly became very quickly resistant to all these single target uh, pesticides. And as a result, you see that the number of sprays, uh, which used to be two sprays per season, and the UK had to go up to uh, more sprays to still control uh, uh, this disease. Now, if you look a bit further at the pesticide use in France, I, I got this figure to, to show you here uh, the average number of treatments per year in several crops. And I will focus only on the fungicides. So if you look at the fungicides, which is this gray, green color here, you see that the fungicides are mainly sprayed on grapevine, on apple, I talked already about wheat, and here on potato. And you see that these crops, they need multiple sprays of fungicides. And if you then start to look at the enemy, uh, what do we want to control with these fungicides, um, then you, and, and you dig a little bit into what is going on there, then you will see that if we focus on grapevine, the, the biggest enemy is the downy mildew. You have powdery mildew as well, but downy mildew is the most difficult to control. Uh, it's an oomycete, plasmopara. You have uh, on potato, of course, the late blight pathogen Phytophthora, which is also an oomycete. And on apple, you have apple scab, which is an ascomycete called Venturia. And if you look at these three crops, they have something in common. Uh, the, the grapevine and apple are perennial crops. And these crops are also vegetatively propagated. But if you look at the pathogens, uh, they also have a lot in, uh, uh, in common. I call these pathogens the big tree. Uh, I think they are agricultural superbugs. Uh, so why is that? So these are leaf pathogens. They have relatively similar life cycles. They are all polycyclic diseases, so with a primary and a secondary cycle. They have high genomic plasticity and large population sizes, and they can have a high genetic diversity. And they, we need multiple treatments to keep them under control. They all show a very high risk for uh, resistance development against fungicides. And on top of that, they are very difficult to control in organic agriculture. So that means that there are very few good alternatives to control these bugs. And in, in organic agriculture, there's a heavy reliance on the use of copper. And I just want to illustrate the plasticity of these pathogens with this uh, uh, graph about Phytophthora and Festans. Uh, so this is a, there's a very interesting uh, website, which is called Euroblight, and you can follow the genotypes of Phytophthora and Festans year after year. And what you can see here, each color is a different genotype. So you have to understand Phytophthora and Festans in, 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 in Europe West, uh, is a clone that changes all the time. And you can see that first we had the dominance of the blue clone. The blue clone is the 30A2. And this blue clone is resistant against metalaxyl, which is a fungicide that was used a lot. And it also could break through the resistance of a, of a resistant potato, which is called sterling. And then you see that this uh, blue clone is uh, slowly replaced by other clones because farmers start to use less metalaxyl. And then there came the green clone. The green clone uh, showed uh, reduced resistance to a new pesticide that farmers use, which is fluazinam. And this new clone is again fit and aggressive. Um, of course, then farmers start to use less of this product. And then you see nowadays in France, for instance, you have a predominance of the pink clone. The pink clone is the 36A2. Uh, it's becoming dominant in France. This is the, these are the data that I took for 2021. This is a very aggressive clone that also gives tuber blight. And th this just illustrates to you that these pathogens are not just a static single organism, but they, these are actually populations of highly dynamic clones. So it's a really difficult to control them. 
Um, so just some figures about the cost of controlling only this type of pathogens. You see some values about the potato production. For instance, in Europe, it's 1.7 million hectares. Uh, the value is 12 billion euros, and the cost for Phytophthora control alone is about 1 billion euro, huh? just to show you how, how dangerous these pathogens are. Uh, organic potato production, uh, you can see it's reflected in the figure. It's very low. Uh, it's only 32,000 hectares of the 1.7 million hectares are under organic potato production. And there, they rely very heavily again on the use of copper, and the yield is much lower. And depending on the disease pressure, because these diseases are very much influenced by the weather, uh, you need a 4 to 10 sprays. And so if you have susceptible varieties, uh, then sometimes if the disease pressure is high, you, can, you just don't have any yields. And so if we think about the transition to plant health, uh, you're all aware of that. So the chemical crop protection is really aimed at killing. Uh, then you have the integrated pest management that goes to the reducing the levels of the pests and the pathogens. And then, of course, you have the, the concepts of the agroecological crops protection that is more focusing on plant health and strengthening the plant. Um, I think you're all aware of, of the, the principles of agroecological crop protection. One of the differences I think that I would like to point out with the organic farming is that the use of synthetic pesticides can, is, can be used as a large resort, uh, because while this is not the case uh, uh, for the, um, the, the organic farming. Now, um, what we need, and it has been said already several times this morning, is this transition to what I call sustainable in intensification. So uh, what do we mean with sustainable intensification is that we need to increase the overall system performance without any net environmental costs, but also without clearing more land, uh, because we should avoid clearing more land, uh, because we have also e uh, valuable ecosystems that we want to conserve. And to, to make this transition, you, you, there are three different steps. First of all, you, you start with increasing efficiency, so that is making better use of existing farm configurations, and that is, for instance, use precision farming, uh, decision support systems, and so on to spray, uh, to, to target your sprays a bit better. And then the second step will be the substitution. So that means that we're going to replace uh, the existing, uh, the pesticides, the synthetic pesticides with new technologies and practices. And then actually what we need is the whole toolbox. We definitely need uh, new crop varieties uh, with more tolerance to biotic and abiotic stress. I think the next speaker will focus on that. We need our biopesticides, but that means that also registration of these biopesticides should become easier. We need the plant defense stimulators, we need the RNAi, and maybe we need also uh, some uh, uh, genetic manipulations uh, like CRISPR-Cas can also help. And then finally, we need to redesign some of our agroecosystems uh, to strengthen that uh, resilience. Now, how can you do that for our big three? Uh, think about apple, uh, grapevine, and uh, um, a potato. And there I got some inspiration from a very nice paper that was uh, made by Inrai. And in that paper, they were looking uh, for to see whether we can replace copper in organic farming. And they looked, they made a very detailed uh, literature survey uh, to look uh, what are the alternatives uh, in organic farming for the use of copper uh, to treat apple, grapevine, and potato. But I think their findings are also very relevant for conventional farming. And they developed a kind of very theoretical transition scenarios. And what, this is the transition scenario for downy mildew and grapes. And they state themselves, and I agree with them, that, that this is probably one of the most difficult uh, changes to be made. So the first step can be the reduction. Uh, and the first step, the efficacy, is uh, just to reduce the copper rates. 
Uh, in, this, in the substitution phase, you have to look for alternatives. But unfortunately, when you speak about downy mildew and grapes, there are very few alternatives that work well. So that means you will have to use your whole toolbox, the natural biocides, the plant defense stimulators. And what we also need is decision support systems to, to really know how to place our biopesticides. Now, what you can see here is the, the level of efficacy. The greener it is, the better these uh, alternatives work. And you see in the case of downy mildew, the alternatives actually do not have a very strong performance, so that means you need them, actually all of them. And then the most difficult part, especially here in France, will be the redesign, because in the redesign, I think we need to introduce the resistant cultivars. But of course, in France, huh, this is a complicated issue because you are very fond of your wine and your tastes. And if you talk about grapevine hybrids, huh, OK, it's, a, it's another discussion. But if you really want to, to, to solve the problem of downy mildew and grapevine, you have to think about that, together with some other cultural practices that you can see here that, uh, that also need to be done. Um, they have developed similar scenarios for, uh, for the two other diseases. Apple scab will probably be the most easy one uh, because there are several alternatives that can be used. There are several good biopesticides, plant defense stimulators, um, and uh, you see the same scenario. So we can go uh, almost immediately to substitution by combining cultural practices, resistance, and uh, biopesticides. And then finally, the redesign will, will, we will need also there more cultivar, uh, cultivar mixtures. And then the final one is the potato late blight. That will be a difficult one as well. And I think there, especially the resistant cultivars will become very important. And this has already been shown, for instance, in the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands, also I think in Denmark, uh, it's completely forbidden to use copper in, uh, in organic farming. And there they have really shifted to these resistant cultivars. And the redesign will also, uh, we need to focus more on these uh, uh, other uh, approaches like cultivar mixtures and so on. Uh, so the take home message is that this sustainable intensification that will go in several steps is really uh, needed. Our, our current agriculture is too strongly based on this monoculture of a limited number of crops because the diseases that I have mentioned, they occur worldwide. And the system is very vulnerable to these uh, pathogens. And these new and aggressive pathogens, they, they disperse worldwide. And they are very difficult to control. And I, we can also have examples like that for weeds and pests. And the pesticides, our chemical pesticides, guarantee high yields until now huh, in these vulnerable crops, but this pesticide resistance will become really the major issue. And uh, what you really need to understand is that these aggressive pathogens that we have in agriculture are comparable with the superbugs in medicine that we can also uh, that are also very difficult to control, and so that we will need our whole toolbox of diversified solutions to keep them under control. And the last remark that I would like to make is then that when we take decisions about food production, they should be pragmatic and evidence-based rather than ideological. And with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much, Monica, for this very complete and uh, comprehensive um, paper. Do we have any questions in the audience for Monica? Yes, over to the right, lady in the red jacket. I recognize, I believe it's Violette. Uh, thank you. Um, very interesting um, presentation. I have one question. Uh, what we know is that glyphosate application uh, strongly affects beneficial soil bacteria, and so the pathogens, the f uh, fungi, over take over, and they don't have enemies anymore in the soils. Does this as well have something to do with the pathogens you mentioned in potatoes and apples? Or is it independently? Don't they grow in the soil in, during winter time? Uh, so the, the pathogens that, that I, I mentioned, all three are leaf pathogens. Uh, but they have, of course, a survival phase, uh, more on crop residues, uh, not so much in soil. In the case of uh, Phytophthora and Festins, it depends whether you have uh, the sexual 
phase of the disease because then they can make all spores and these all spores can survive. And that sexual phase is, is rather common in northern countries, but not so much here in this region. So it is not a very strong survival in soil. It, I would say it's more a survival in crop residues in this. Uh, for instance, apple scab survives on, on leaves, huh? so not really in the soil. Huh? So for these three pathogens, they are mainly airborne. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question over here uh, on the left. Yes, thanks very much for your comprehensive overview. Very helpful to have the, the whole picture. Uh, I have one comment with respect to your last statement where you said we need a, a diversified toolbox. Uh, can you comment perhaps on the time horizon that would be needed to have a, a toolbox really in place? that could be used for different crops and different applications. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the first, I can I comment on? On the time horizon that is needed to have uh, a, such toolbox at hand that is really usable uh, for the aims that and the targets yeah. that we heard so, at the so beginning So I, I, of the I think, and, and it's also very uh, clear in, in that INRAI paper that, that I think is very um, informative, is that you, what we need is this research that really people look at the integration of these different strategies uh, because every single substitution uh, is, is in, in itself not very efficient. Uh. So I think, unless people know better, that there are, for instance, not no good biopesticides against these three patterns, not something that will control to uh, a level equally as, as, as the, the, the products that we are using now. So that means you, we would really need the, the research where you combine uh, resistant varieties with the use of biopesticides, with plant defense stimulators. And it's probably not the most um, sexy research to do for a young scientist, but I think this is what we need. Uh, we need to see whether these integrated approaches will really work in the field. Huh? And then, of course, we have the whole issue of the redesign, which could be in some crops uh, be a bit problem. I think 2025 is, very <laughs> is a very short period, yeah. especially because we are speaking about uh, two of the crops are perennial. Huh? This will be very difficult, I think, yeah. to do it in a short time. Huh? It will take time. That's my, my opinion. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. Don't